Soon, another troop ship will be slipping out from an English port, dropping down on the tide toward the ocean beyond. A common enough sight these days, and commonplace maybe, except for those who leave. And those who stay behind. For them comes a sharp break with familiar things. And as they set sail, the cheers and songs hide mixed emotions. No new thing for Britain, this sending of men to the far corners of the earth. What is new is the kind of force she sends, a hard core of professionals, and for the rest, young men called up for national service. This is something that affects the life of every man in Britain of military age. Today, all must serve their time in the armed forces. And even when they return to their jobs in field and factory, their obligation is not ended. Those who were soldiers, for example, must serve with Britain's great reserve force, the Territorial Army. Like this young man here. His day's work over, he's turning up for one of the compulsory training parades. The skill and knowledge he has acquired as a national serviceman must be kept up to date, for there is no telling when he might be needed. Permission to join the car, Sergeant. Where have you been? Got held up because of trains. Bad weather. No excuse. Right. Falling over there. It is not long since many of the men here, like the Sergeant Instructor, gained the Medal of Korea, where they served alongside the Americans, the first in the field. And with men from Canada, from South Africa, from India, from Australia and New Zealand, and many other countries. For the first time, the free nations of the world fought together in the name of the United Nations. At any time, the need may arise again. Following the swift action of the United States, Britain sent all the forces she could spare. The contribution might have been greater, but for the heavy commitments laid on British arms throughout the world. In Malaya, for example, close to the communist powers of Asia, an army battles for the rule of law, so that the races of this ancient land may live in peace. and strong points to the world over on the George Cross Island of Malta in Gibraltar on the shores of North Africa along the routes to the Far East in Hong Kong and a host of others which must be guarded for the defense of Britain and the Commonwealth and in Europe in support of the North Atlantic Treaty more British forces serve alongside their European and American allies than ever before in time of peace the small professional forces on which Britain used to rely cannot meet these huge demands. The new situation called for a new departure. And so, without liking it, the British have accepted compulsory national service in peacetime for as long as may be necessary. And all young men must enroll for a full two years with the active forces. The accent is on all. There are practically no exemptions except for the unfit. Few deferments that are not temporary, like John Saunders here. He's been deferred for a few years to serve an apprenticeship. But now his time has come. Hello, John. What are you looking so happy about? Got out of my medical, that's what. Going up next week. Not to worry. So have I, and I'm married. Even that doesn't get me off. What does Mary think about it? Not too keen, of course. You've got to do it, so you may as well get something out of it. Well, come on, come on, lads. It's time we were on shift. Well, that's roughly the attitude of most of the boys. Let's make the best of it. Some are eager to go, but for others, married men or those with dependents, the sacrifice is greater. John turns up at the allocation center for his medical, one of the many drawn with equal impartiality from all sections of the community. The 
There's some form filling, of course. Details of medical history, previous jobs and education. This will help to show where he can best be used. Some are a bit nervous, but they needn't be. Swift and efficient, the procedure is not at all inhuman. John Saunders is fit all right. Now it's his turn to see the military interviewing officer. He says he'd like to be an RASC driver, but so do thousands of others. Let's see then what happens to him. One fine day, a few weeks later, John arrives from the station, sharing with a few others the carriage thoughtfully put at his disposal by the army. Posted to the 68th Training Regiment Royal Armoured Corps. There are no tanks about as they arrive. They'll see plenty of them later, though. First things first. The army takes hold of the new arrivals firmly and with the ease of long practice. The barrack rooms are, well, all right. Not quite like home. But they'll do. The army, like all the other services, handles its new intake intelligently. If a man's to give of his best, his attitude of mind towards his new life is important. First, the simple things that are necessary to make the close-knit army life tolerable for all. Uniform and tidiness of personal kit. Now for something about the history and achievements of the corps they've joined, so that they can begin to be proud of it. And a word about why they're here. Next, the personnel selection officer puts them through a series of tests to find out which job each man is best fitted for. John discusses his future with the PSO who makes his recommendations. Then the five weeks general military training begins. On the parade ground, the sergeant takes over. They've heard from the squadron officers and the CO. They know why they're here and what to do about their family worries, if any. But now, he says, you're going to listen to me. Squad, squad, sir. Move to the left in threes, left, top. Right or right, quick. Hard. So begins the first stage, five tough packed weeks in which to lay the foundations of discipline, basic knowledge and fitness on which all else is built. Upright and alert, they are beginning to acquire a new self-confidence. Here at the passing out parade, they prove themselves ready for the second stage, the technical training. Well, perhaps not quite ready. The passing out parade must be celebrated first. Same again. <laughs> oh, 
my daughter. Now, round two has commenced. The eight weeks of core training. The men are split up according to their aptitudes as gunners, signaler loaders, and drivers. Among the NCO instructors are many veterans of World War II and of Korea, able to back up their teaching with actual battle experience. In a full-sized instructional turret, John learns the elements of gunnery under the watchful eye of a sergeant instructor. Load it! Sabo action, Travis right. Steady on. 1,000. Tank. 1,000. Up. On by now. Before long, on the open range, he proves himself to be an apt pupil. On a miniature battleground, tank tactics are taught and practiced over and over again. Each operator in turn acts as a tank commander. Maintenance in the field is of the greatest importance. And very soon, John and his pals are fitting tracks weighing two tons apiece with the ease of veterans. Now comes the mastery of the gearbox, which transmits the power from the two giant engines. And then practical driving on the hundreds of acres of hill and moorland surrounding the depot. This is real work. Ahead lies two years of hard training, broadening out from the handling of weapons and equipment to battle exercises in ever more realistic conditions. The transformation of Draft 07 from raw civilians to modern tank crewmen proceeds apace. The foundations have been laid. What remains can only be learned in the hard, practical school of a regiment. So John is posted abroad, and off he goes with a trainload of others bound for stations in many parts of the world. Abroad, the British servicemen soon adapt themselves to new surroundings and different ways of life. No matter where they may be, they find friendliness among strange peoples. All of them learn that the world is wide and they grow wiser in its ways. Meantime, in Germany, John Saunders, now a fully-fledged corporal, shakes down in barracks. He goes on maneuvers a few times and begins to see how much there is to learn in this trade of soldiering. Perhaps a few months left of his two years, he's become a really useful, experienced tank commander. Permission to fall out, sir. Carry on, Corporal. For himself, he lives a hard life, but a good one, with plenty of sport in his off time. A fully trained soldier who has become immensely more capable and self-reliant. So much for the individual, but what of the army these young men serve? Watch it as it goes into action in the plains of Germany. John Saunders now finds himself a tiny but important unit taking part in the biggest exercise of the year.
Five rounds, gunfire, fire! goes on, and so realistic is the training amidst the noise, the dust and the smoke of battle, one almost forgets that it is an exercise. It is only by such realism that we can forge and keep keen the powerful forces we need for the joint defense of ourselves and our allies. Many of these young men will stay on in the army for a time. Some will make it a satisfying career, but most will soon be back in civilian life. New age groups will be called to take their places to keep Britain's reserves fresh and ever growing. They seek no war, these young men, but they accept the duty of national service as part of the price that must be paid to keep their country free and safe. And should the need arise, we know that John Saunders and thousands like him will slip back into uniform, fit and ready for whatever is asked of them.